Okay, so we'll sing Gai Gora Modul Sore. Hopefully he's there on the board. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, I'll do on the phone. Gai Gora Modul Sore Gai Gora Madhusare Gai Gora Gai Gora Madhusare Gai Gora Madhusare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Gai Gora Madhusare, Gai Gora. Grieta ko vanne ta ko Sadari vole da ko Suge duke bolo na ko Vadanari nam korore Suke duke Gai Gora Madhusare Gai Gora Gai Gora Madhusare Gai Maya jale bada hoye, acho miche ka jaloye. Eko na chetan na pe radha madhav naam bolo re. Eko na chetan na pe Gai Gora Madhusare Gai Gora Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Jeeva na hoi lo shesha Na bhai ji le rishi ke sha Na 
भक्ति विनोदोपदेश नमरा समो रे भक्ति विनो गाय गौरा मधुस्वरे हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण जय ओम विष्णुपाद परमहंस परिव्राजकाचार्य स्त्रोत्र सत्य श्री श्रीमद अभय चरणारविंद भक्ति वेदांत स्वयं महाराज प्रभुपाद की जय अनंत कोटि वैष्णवृंद की जय श्री वेद शास्त्र की जय हिताय गुरु परमानंदे क्विकली रीड दी ट्रांसलेशन Lord Gaura Sundara sings in a very sweet voice Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Whether you are a householder or a sanyasi constantly chant Hari Hari Do not forget this chanting whether you are in a happy condition or a distressful one just fill your lips with the Hari Nam You are bound up in the network of maya and are forced to toil fruitlessly now you have obtained full consciousness in the human form of life so chant the names of radha madhava and also radha govinda <laughs> your life may end at any moment and you have not served the lord of the senses rishikesh therefore bhakti vinod thakur states that just take this advice and relish even one time the nectar of hari naam shila bhakti vinod thakur ke jai so we will continue now with the discussion on shrimad bhagavatam om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Narayanam namaskritya Naram cheva narottamam Devim saraswatim vyasam Tato jaya mudirayet Nashtha prayeshva bhadresu नित्यम भागवत सेवया भगवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवती नास्तिके सो वी आर रीडिंग टुडे फ्रॉम द थर्ड कैंटो चैप्टर 28 टेक्स्ट 27 सो इट्स ऑन द बोर्ड जस्ट वी विल रिपीट बहुम चमंदर गिरे परिवर्तते न निर्णित बाहु वलयान अधिलोक पालान 
ಸಂಚಿದಯ ಶತಾರಂ ಅಸಹ್ಯ ತೇಜ ಶಂಕಂ ಚ ತತ್ಕರಸರೂ ಪ್ರಜಹಂಸ finish what time 9 class 9 okay so we will just to save time because we sang longer song just to save time we will skip repetition bahun the arms cha and mandare gire of mount mandara parivartate na nirnikta polished bahuvalayan the arm ornaments adhilokapalan the source of the controllers of the universe sanchintayet one should meditate on dasha shata aram the sudarshana disk Ten hundred spokes. Asahya tejaha Dazzling luster. Shankam The conch. Cha Also. Tatkara In the hand of the Lord. Sururuha Lotus-like. Rajahangsam Like a swan. Translation. The yogi should further meditate upon the lord's four arms which are the source of all the powers of the demigods who control the various functions of material nature then the yogi should concentrate on the polished ornaments which were burnished by mount mandara as it revolved he should also duly contemplate the lord's discus the sudarshana chakra which contains 1000 spokes and a dazzling luster as well as the conch which looks like a swan in his lotus like palm purport all departments of law and order emanate from the arms of the supreme personality of godhead the law and order of the universe is directed by different demigods and it is here said to emanate from the lord's arms mandara hill is mentioned here because when the ocean was churned by the demons on one side and the demigods on the other mandara hill was taken as the churning rod the lord in his toitois incarnation became the pivot for the churning rod and thus his ornaments were polished by the turning of mandara hill in other words the ornaments on the arms of the lord are as brilliant and lustrous as if they had been polished very recently the wheel in the hand of the lord called the sudarshana chakra has 1000 spokes the yogi is advised to meditate upon each of the spokes he should meditate upon each and every one of the component parts of the transcendental form of the lord ಓಂ ಅಜ್ಞಾನತಿ ಮೀರಾಂಗಸಗನಾಂಜನ ಶಲಾಕಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರಿನ್ ಮಿಲಿತಂ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗಿರುವೈ ನಮಃ ನಮ ನಾಮಶ್ರೇಷ್ಠ ಮನಮಿ ಶಚಿಪುತ್ರ ಮತ್ತೂಪಂ ತಸ್ಯಾಘ್ರಜಮುರುಪುರಿ ಮಾತೃಂ ಗೋಷ್ಠವತೀಂ ರಾಧಾಕುಂಡಂ ಗಿರಿವರ ಮಹೋರಾಧಿಗ ಮಾಧವಾಶಾಂ ಪ್ರಾಪ್ತ ಪ್ರತಿದ ಕೃಪಾ ಶಿಗುರು ತಂ ನೋಸ್ ನಮೋ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪಾದಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪ್ರೇಷ್ಠಾಯ ಬುಧಲೇ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನೀತಿ ನಾಮನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸಾರಸ್ವತೆ ದೇವೇ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶತಾರಿಣೆ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ದ್ವೈತಕರಾಧರ ಶಿವಾಸಾದಿ ಗೌರ್ಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ್ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ್ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಎ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಹೋಲ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಇಸ್ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಅ ಲಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಎಸೆನ್ಷಿಯಲ್ ಆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಫ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಯೋಗ uh being expounded here in this chapter and it's also linking uh how to meditate on personal aspects of the lord so this is the specific importance of especially the shrimad bhagavatam that without knowing the details of the personality of godhead without knowing his glories it's very difficult to develop love 
So therefore we find that in many traditions around the world, because there is a lack of personal understanding and relationship, therefore although there is some attraction and some fear, some reverence for God in all the different types of rasas, at the same time the relationship is severely hampered due to a lack of personal information about the Lord. So this chapter is very nice. Uh, I actually work, uh, sometimes I teach philosophy for yoga groups. So, uh, especially in Miami. So there, I never actually read certain texts, but they expect you to teach those texts. So the main one which they, they teach also Bhagavad Gita in a very light, level, light way. <laughs> Not so much uh, very pure understanding, but more like Brahma Jyoti level understanding. But uh, they also emphasize, especially in Western yoga schools, the Yoga Sutras. But generally in India, that's not such a commonly read text. It's not such an important text compared to Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Purana, Vishnu Purana, Vedanta Sutra, Upanishads, Mahabharata, Ramayana. But Yoga Sutras is there, but it's not so important. But I had to study that text because you have to teach it. So luckily if you learn under Srila Prabhupada, then you can understand everything nicely, including Yoga Sutra. Because Prabhupada gives us the correct foundational knowledge. Although he also gives the highest, but first Prabhupada gives us a very strong foundation. That's why his Bhagavad Gita is so thick. Generally Bhagavad Gita is half the size. Some people also comment, but Prabhupada's commentary is very rich. So many Acharyas. Why? Because he wants the basic information to become very strong. <coughs> Similarly, we know that Prabhupada, <coughs> although he gave us around 60 volumes of books, some of them also later were posthumous compilations, but <coughs> he also gave thousands of lectures. But if you listen to the lectures, because at that time it was a new movement, generally he always <coughs> emphasizes the basic philosophy very strongly. And sometimes people, they may say, oh, your Prabhupada was very sweet, very nice, but he only gave basics. <laughs> sometimes people, they give this kind of philosophy. But actually Prabhupada did that because we need to have a very strong foundation. That way we can understand the more deeper topics appropriately. So in the same way, this particular chapter, it's starting with a very basic understanding of what is Dhyana Yoga. So we can go back to the first text. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you. It was last night I took Prashad late, you know, so <laughs> comes too much kappa in the world. <laughs> so we look at text one, twenty-eight. Very interesting. So he says that Yogasya Lakshanam Vakshe Sabijasya Nripad Maje Mano Yaineva Vidhina Prasannam Yati Satpatham. So this whole chapter is specifically he is building upon the principle of the yoga system. And actually there is a specific word he uses which we don't study so much in Bhagavatam, but that word is used in the Yoga Sutras. Just like when we study Bhakti or even uh, karma yoga we have like um, different technical words which we are using like nishkam karma yoga sakam karma yoga like that and then you have different levels of bhakti so in the same way in the yoga sutras there is a very uh, scientific and a very very detailed and a very strict definition given of the different stages of yoga so this particular word actually he is using generally we don't know because in Bhagavatam it's not discussed but that sabija is particular technical term used for different type of samadhi. And there is savitarka, nirvitarka, sabija, nirbija samadhi. So sabija means it comes, you have a specific impetus of meditation. So the goal given in the Yoga Sutras, this is the yoga school, is that swarupe avasthanam, that one becomes situated in the swarupa. So the more entry level type of this yoga system which is called dhyana yoga that is the official term later on it, be, you, it becomes to be called ashtanga yoga right? but the original term basically in terms of vedas is dhyana yoga 
and then later there is different names. Sometimes they give also Raja Yoga. So this sometimes they call it. Um, there is different names they give, but this particular process of Dhyana Yoga they is emphasize that Swarupa Avasthanam, and that the goal is to develop Samadhi. So Sama means complete, right? Just like we have some Kirtan, complete Kirtan. So this samadhi means that you, when you've perfected this stage of meditation. So the last, so everyone knows eh, the eight stages. You also read in Prabhupada's books. So first is yama and niyama. So we find that here also. Then in the next text, that those are called vidhi. So in the first text, she mentions those, and those vidhi is called yama and niyama. So then it's mentioned here. And number four is mentioning directly those same things which you find exactly the same ones in Yoga Sutra. A little bit different but almost the same. So Ahimsa, Satyam, Asteyam and then Aparigraha. Here he says he gives a more um, open uh, definition of Aparigraha. Aparigraha means non-attachment. It literally means not to gra grab onto things. <laughs> Graha means to grasp. That's where the English word grasp comes from. So, aparigraha means non-possessiveness. But he is saying here, yavad artha parigraha. That as much as necessary, just holding on to certain things. So, because Gita also, we hear a lot of emphasis not on, for instance, I think it's in Bhagavatam, not in the Gita. That is, we say ahimsa, right? But if you expand what does ahimsa mean, it means na ati himsa, not excessive violence. Because it's impossible to avoid 100% violence, right? If you have that philosophy, 100% avoidance of violence, that's Jain philosophy, but it's not possible. Therefore, there is a five yagyas they used to do in Vedic times, that there are five, not five yagyas, there is a five things you do a yagya for to avoid the karma. For instance, when you light a fire, then you kill many insects. So there are five items which are given, that these five things, we cannot avoid violence, so we have to do yagya just to neutralize. Now we have Sankirtan Yaga, everything is simple, shortcut. That's Lord Goranga's mercy. But traditionally they, ha they had to be very conscious of all of these things. For instance, when you wake up, then you have to say mantra to Bhumi Devi before you put your feet. So, so many things were there. So he's emphasizing in the beginning of this chapter, Yamas and Niyamas. So it's very interesting. And we find that <clears throat> because sometimes we hear Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, especially some of our ISKCON scholars, we use the English word of principles and details, right? Just like Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is giving very strict definition of the difference between principles and details. That the principles are things which cannot change. Details, they can be changed according to time, place and circumstance. For instance, the principle is we should always take prasadam, right? So that we cannot change. That's absolute. The detail of how to cook the prasad or in certain exceptional circumstances there can be some adjustment given. Just like the Shastra explained there is a four circumstance uh, in which you can what is that verse? I have here. It's very interesting. I'll share with you. I can't find now. But anyway, there is a four circumstances uh, in which you can adjust the principles. One is when you're traveling, another time is in a time of war, and I forget the other two. I had the verse, but I don't have now. So, the detail you can change according to time and place. So, that's what Kapila is explaining, that this, these are principles, Ahimsa, Satya, Asteya, but the Niyamas, they are details. So, therefore, it's explained, we discussed this on Tuesday, actually. Not like in this way, but we discuss the same verse. That Yoga Sutra explains that the Mahavrata, this great vow, is that, I forget the Sanskrit now. Uh, jati, Desha, no, I, maybe I have the verse here. Let me check. Ah, yeah, here. Yeah. We discussed this on Tuesday, so I still have it. Jati, Desha, Kala, Samai, Anavicha, Naha, Mahavratam. That there is no exceptions to the principles of bhakti regardless of um, he says jati ethnicity because in that time there were so many strictures that if you're not a brahmana you don't have access to certain things but Prabhupada often uses the Sanskrit word for uh, for time place and circumstance what's the one he uses for yeah uh, pat patra so but Deshakala uses the same word 
So for time, place and circumstance or time, place and ethnicity. But circumstance and ethnicity are interchangeable. So the, the niyamas, they can be adjusted according to certain time and place. So then he starts describing uh, different other principles like pranayama. Then he's also describing asana. In the modern times, there is a more emphasis on reviving specific asanas. But in terms of Shastric basis for asana, there is not really so much quantity of asanas given. There are some kind of medieval texts which they are not really so ancient. There is one called Geranda Samhita, there is one called Shiva Samhita and then there is a text called Hatha Yoga Pradipika. So if you do yoga you may have heard of this, especially in India people hear of these things. In the West they don't know, they just know Yoga Sutra. So the goal of Yoga Sutras is not the same as goal of Hatha Yoga Pradipika. This I recently learned by Hari Parshada Prabhu. He explained this point. Because the Hatha Yoga Pradipika is using asana itself as some kind of form of enlightenment, some kind of form of uh, Swarupa Avastanam. But Yoga Sutras, the asana is just a means to an end. But the end is Dhyana. So therefore, Kapila, he explains all of these stages over these verses and then he starts to explain in, in text number 9, clearing the vital air, inhaling. So he's literally describing pranayama. When I grew up originally in ISKCON, <laughs> because sometimes when we're new, this is just sociology of religion, then we tend to emphasize only certain principles in a black and white manner without understanding the niyama, without understanding detail, without understanding there is variety and without understanding the in the Gita himself Krishna gives if you cannot do this do this right so but in the beginning we're like this is right this is wrong so there is a nice lecture by Vishnu Jan Swami so any of you listen to his kirtans uh, you should all listen very important if you're a member of ISKCON you have to listen <laughs> Prabhupada said his kirtan is just like the Gandharvas Prabhupada loved his kirtan so there are only I think three or four there's only like three long recordings of lectures and then there are some small excerpts from his preaching programs. And he makes a nice point. He explains that how uh, sometimes we are in the beginning, we are a little bit like very strict, like this is okay, this is not okay, a little bit fanatic. So he explains that that's okay in the beginning because that helps us to, when you're not sure what is safe and unsafe, it's better to be err on the side of caution. Just like Jayadvaita Maharaj gave a class, he said, nobody ever fell down from being too strict. So, but if you, when there is some leniency, you have to have intelligence how to adjust. That's why Prabhupada said to one of his disciples, they asked him this question. He said that to understand difference between principle and detail, he said that requires some intelligence. <laughs> so Vishnu Jan Swami explained that to protect the creeper of devotional service, sometimes we are more overly careful, overly cautious. So I was always thinking, oh, yoga is not good, this asana, this pranayama is all nonsense. Then later, because I have to teach to that community, I have to practice and learn myself. Because you cannot teach something unless you are practicing. So even if I'm not literally teaching asana, but I have to understand the whole text. And I have to understand all of these principles. So then I understood uh, that actually there is a lot of value in, uh, in these principles, because they can help also to make the mind stronger and also keep the health strong. But of course, in the beginning, if we get distracted, it's not good. But later on, as we are maturing as devotees, we realize that there are some sociological things we can improve in ISKCON. One of them is eating, quality of what we eat. Especially when we are young, then we used to eat 10 maha sweets. <laughs> so how old are you? You are young, right? Like 20 or something? 20. So when I was his age, I would eat two plates of Mahaprasad. <laughs> now at age 30, because of doing that, I've spoiled my digestion. So if I eat fried thing, I get sick. But it wouldn't have been like that if when I was your age, I was sense controlled. <laughs> so imagine, if you do that longer, when you're 50, 60, then they, you have to be very careful. So we find the same thing as Lord Chaitanya was teaching, that in the beginning he was telling them, Akanta Bhajan, like in Ratyatra, he was feeling described up to the neck for the people who are new, because the prasadam purifies you. But later, with his own disciple, he was very strict how much they eat. Therefore, we hear so many extreme leelas of six Goswamis, 
that for instance was Raghunath Das, right? He was taking the rice which was left over from Jagannath Puri temple, which nobody was taking, he was taking that. And who was taking only a small bit of buttermilk? It was also Raghunath Das, every day, yeah? So once Srila Tamal Krishna Maharaj, Prabhupada's secretary, he asked Prabhupada about that, about six Goswamis, because uh, he was so busy being a secretary, that he said to Prabhupada, I am so busy thinking about management, that I can't even do quality rounds. <laughs> and then he says that I don't have time to do my sadhana properly. Then Prabhupada says, how many hours you are sleeping? Then he gave the number. Prabhupada says, then cut that by two hours, and then you can have more time. He said, that's very difficult. So then one point he asked Prabhupada, that the six Goswamis, they were living in such an austere way. So how are they strong? And I never heard anyone else say this, but Tamal Krishna said this. He said, six Goswamis, that they were so austere, that it was not easy for them, even they were very weak, and sometimes they were stumbling, because they were very austere. So Prabhupada says, but you cannot do that, because they are doing out of ecstasy. So we cannot imitate, but we have to follow the principle, right? So Tamal Krishna then he understood, okay, the principle is that I have to give up sense gratification and do an austerity to the amount that I can take. So the same thing with controlling eating, the same thing with being yukta hara viharasya, and it's also explained that recreation, Prabhupada says. So therefore we have to also make sure that we're not being lazy to take care of our physical health. Just like when Prabhupada had his heart issue, then doctor told him that you have to do some stronger exercise. Then he said, okay, strictly, I'm going to do brisk walk every morning. It wasn't morning walk, casual walk. He was doing brisk walk. Because that's almost like jogging, the same health benefit. So Prabhupada was very strict. So we have to find whatever it is, but we have to also be conscious to preserve our health nicely. So that's why yama, niyama, asana, pranayama is important. So the body is very healthy, mind is very healthy. Sometimes we think only physical health is important. But mental health is also important. And then pranayama. Pranayama has extreme uh, benefits in the health for clearing disease, so many things. Because how are the yogis doing such severe austerities? Because they had a very strong body, because they prepared it to do meditation. So then he's explaining from text 12 until now 27. He's describing now how to do this, uh, what is called dharana, dhyana and samadhi. So these are the steps of meditation. Pratyahara means you're slowly detaching from sense objects, from sense gratification, becoming more and more detached. Because if you're not detached, then when you meditate, the things you're attached to will re-enter, right? So therefore, Pratyahara means counter-ahara, counter-consumption, counter-attachment, counter-relationship with objects of the senses. Our principle, we have Pratyahara, but we call it, what is the word? Which Rupa Goswami gives. But what is the word? We have some type of detachment, renunciation. Yeah, Yukta Vairagya. What you said is also correct, but in other words. But what I'm looking for, that one, Yukta Vairagya, right? So, because we have a different relationship as a Sankirtan movement, preaching movement. This is an ascetic movement. This is a, a more renunciate type of movement. The yoga, that's just like Brahmacharya. So Brahmacharya, he's specifically thinking that people to be Brahmacharya, Brahmacharya whole life. But in Bhakti, we understand that we have to also give scope for others. But because Bhakti is working for the soul directly, Bhagavata Marga, then Vanasham is not so, we're not so strict, only Brahmachari. You can also be Grasta. So, but in this particular uh, Dhyana Yoga process, he's recommending Brahmachari specifically. So then you start the meditation process. So then, He's describing the eyes, the ruddy eyes and the lotus-like countenance, the conch shell. So we hear late, later on again these personal effects, the four things which Lord Vishnu Narayan holds. Then his loins are covered by a shining cloth yellowish and then Sri Vatsa is there and then he's describing Kastuba gem. Then he's describing also the lotus uh, flowers and the different... He says sylvan flower. I don't know what is sylvan. You know what is sylvan flower? So we have to check online. <laughs> sylvan flowers. And his necklace. He has a pearl necklace and a crown and his armlets and bracelets and anklets. So a lot of beautiful uh, golden ornaments which the Lord is wearing. And then his loins and hips are encircled by a girdle. So Krishna also wears some kind of belt, some kind of girdle. 
then he stands on the lotus of his devotee's heart. So that's very beautiful meditation. Eh? <laughs> that in my heart there is a lotus and this beautiful form is standing there. So he is the most charming to look at and the serene aspects gladden his eyes. And he's ever youthful. So what is the word ever youthful, you remember? Navayovanam, right? So that's very interesting. The word Yovanam is literally the same word which we get youth from in English. In, in Latin that's Jovan and then Spanish they say Joven because they have colonial influence on their pronunciation. And then in English we say youth. It's the same word from Latin. And same thing old age. You hear old age, right? What is the word for old age, you remember? Jara, right? So in Greek that's called Jerry. Like you know in the hospital geriatric ward. So that's the same word, Jara in Sanskrit. So one should meditate on his form until the mind becomes completely fixed. So this is a practice, this is a sadhana that to envision. Now we have an easier way because we have deities. Because sometimes it's hard. The point of the deity, I heard in a lecture by one of Prabhupada's very senior disciples in England. He says the point of the deity is when you're doing kirtan or when you're doing japa or any time, even in class. I mean now you cannot see because you're facing this way. But I can see. Or if you're sitting like there you can see. But is that you're meditating on the form, so when you close your eyes, you capture that in the mind's eye and then you can meditate on Radha Govinda there. So I'm meditating now like that, Radha Govinda. But our mind is very fickle in Kali Yuga, so it's not easy to capture that. But if you have a very clean, pure mind, as soon as you see that form, you can capture it just like a powerful imprint in the mind. But in these days, there was not so many you know, opportunities, so they also were doing directly in the, maybe in the forest or on the mountains and they were meditating. But we have it, we are more lucky because we have directly DT form. And then we're coming now to the last, oh no, one more here. So then it says, this is very important, when meditating on the Lord, either while closing the eyes and meditating or by seeing the deity, one should meditate and observe and contemplate each aspect of the form of the Lord. This is number... Ah, you're there, yeah? It's number 20, I think. There's still a few more. On all of the collective limbs. So imagine, eh? one by one. And not only the limbs, but all of the personal effects, the personal jewelry, the girdle, the belt, the crown, everything. One should contemplate and relish that beauty. And then let's see here. And it, there's many here. So you can read again later in your own time. You have to read a couple of times to really absorb this. So for time we'll just come, because time is running out, we'll just come now to today's one. So the yogi should further meditate upon the Lord's four arms. So this is specifically for Vishnu Narayana. Also is explained that Krishna when he uh, took the universal form in Gita, then there were many, many arms. But Krishna in Vindavan is a, is a little bit different. <laughs> so our Govinda they is a little bit different that he does not display those four arms. He just displays two arms. Because he wants to be more sweet. So the the form of the Lord with the four personal effects, the Shanka, Chakra, Gada and Padma, that's showing very much opulence, like Narayan aspect. Or Vasudev Krishna is also a little bit more in that mood. But especially Krishna in his youthful Vrindavan Leela, he does not want to display that. That's why when you study, the Sudarshan Chakra Krishna was not using, he was mainly using when, when he was older. In Vrindavan Leela, he was just using his hands. <laughs> if you think about it, right? And even he used his lips, like Putana he used his lips to suck out the life. Or for instance, he was throwing the demons in the air, or he was punching the demons. So, Krishna as a young boy, he doesn't display any weapons. He's just very sweet and soft. His only weapon is his flute. And that weapon, it will kill the attention of all the Brajabhasis. And when they hear that flute, it will kill their attention, just like uh, they may be doing their duties. They may be cleaning some clothes, they may be milking the cows, they may be doing some administrative function, but when they hear the flute, their attention becomes slaughtered and all they can think about is Krishna. It's a big, big distraction. Sometime when Krishna is playing the flute, then Vrijavasi, they become stunned and they don't move and they're just absorbed in ecstasy hearing. 
So this is the unique uh, point of Shama Sundar Krishna that he is so sweet that he does not display any weapons. He can take if he wants, just like Sudarshan Chakra later he used. <clears throat> but he, in, especially in Vrindavan, we meditate on that form as Gaudiya Vaishnava. But here also mentioning, this is also good, we can mention also, you can meditate also on this form. That the yogi should meditate further on the four arms which are the source of all the powers of the demigods. Adiloka Palan. So Adiloka means all of the different parts of the universe. And Palana, Palana means protector. So all of these functions, all of these protective and uh, administrative functions, although they are executed by the demigods, they are executed under the power of the Lord. So this is a very important point. That we have to remember that the Lord has unlimited arms. And in these four arms, he has specific items. So here one of the name is given, Sudarshana Chakra, right? But he has also Gada. You remember what is Gada, Prabhu? In English, how to say, you remember? The club, right? So what is the name of the club of the Lord? Somebody remember? With K. Yeah, exactly. Komalaki and then Shankar. And what is the uh, Shankar, I think, is there in the Gita in the Sanskrit. I don't remember. But what is the name of his uh, uh, conch? Panchajanya, right? So all of the effects, they are actually uh, devotees, but they take that form. They are all personal. And all of, so sometimes the gopis, they are envious of Krishna that, that now he's in the uh, blowing the conch. They are envious that we want to be that position of the conch, <laughs> to taste the nectar of Krishna's lips. So all of these personal things are there of Krishna. So why is he saying that you should meditate on all of them? Because they are all transcendental. Not only Krishna's limbs, they are all transcendental and absolute, but also all of his personal effects. So sometimes we wonder why is it that uh, sometime, in, especially in Upanishads, there is generally impersonal language, mainly 90% is impersonal language, emphasizing the oneness, right? Advaita, and emphasizing more Brahma platform, Brahman platform, right? So sometimes certain words may be used like Arupa or certain word may be used which seem like it's not really promoting uh, Saguna, right? But the reason is, is because first point is they are describing Brahman. Just like there is one very controversial uh, speaker in India, he was banned. I won't say the name, but he's like an Islamic hate preacher. So we, we shouldn't say online the name, maybe someone's watching. <laughs> But uh, he's very controversial. He was banned from India. And he likes to quote a lot of things to, to disrepute the personal aspect of the Lord, deity worship, that the Lord has personal form. Like Bhagavatam is giving very, very direct thing. The yellow dress, the crown, all of these things. So they don't like that. They become, they think that his God is so, so, so big and large and great that he's so great that he can't be personal. So, so then he, he likes to quote many of these things. And many Indians... They lost faith in the Vedas because of him. And one of the things he quotes, it says, Natasya Pratimasti, many things, that there is no reflection of the Lord, so many things. So actually, first point is that he is quoting something which is describing Brahma, not Bhagavan. First of all. So that's correct. We don't, even anyway, we cannot, sometimes we cannot reject those quotes, but what are they describing? They are describing the Brahma aspect of the Lord. But beyond that, another point which I was contemplating, is that another point is that if you say that there is a Rupa and then there is Krishna, there is a Supreme and then there is a Rupa, then you are creating a duality. But the Rupa of Krishna is absolute, is no different directly than Krishna. The holy name, just like, there's, you know Vicharu Prabhu, he was here before. So he gives a class, we were in Mexico, he was giving class and he was saying that some people don't have faith in the holy name. Like, do you think Krishna is in the holy name? You are wrong Prabhu. Krishna is not in the holy name, he is the holy name. <laughs> so he did this. He chastised somebody, he was sitting in the garden and he chastised somebody. He said, Prabhu, you are wrong. He said, you are offender. You are saying that Krishna, you are saying that Abhina Dvam Nami Nomino is incorrect. But Shastra says directly that there is no Bhina, there is no duality between the name and the possessor of the name. So in the same way, the Nam Guna Rupa Lila is absolute with Krishna. None of it is separate. It's non different. So therefore, that's why Bhagavatam is explaining that you should meditate on all of these aspects because they are all non-different than Krishna. 
Just like in the Bhaga, uh, in the Brahma Samhita, what does it say? Somebody remembers there is one nice shloka that any limb of the Lord can do the function of any other limb. Yeah. So that's a, such a beautiful verse. Angani eh? Yasa That's mind boggling. So any limb can do the function of any other limb. Why? Because Krishna is absolute. Your relative, your hand, and your, what do you call this, uh, wrist, then your upper arm, they're all different. But Krishna, his name, his limb, his beautiful eyes, beautiful lips, they're all transcendental and they completely have unlimited power. Just like your hand has limited power, right? Your hand cannot smell. So there are different powers like seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, hearing. So Krishna with any limb, he can do all of those things with any limb. So imagine he's walking with his feet, he can smell. So that's, you cannot find that in the material world. That's called transcendental body, transcendental form. Absolute form. So that's why he's explaining all of these things. You should even meditate on the Sudarshan Chakra. And Kapila Muni is going even more deeper that not only should you meditate on his chakra, but you should meditate on the 1000 spokes of the chakra individually. Imagine, he should also duly, duly means dutifully, contemplate the Lord's discourse which contain 1000 spokes. And then he says in the last uh, one should in the last two uh, sentences the yogi is advised to meditate on upon each of the spokes and each and every component of the path of the transcendental form of the Lord and it's very very nice that the Mandara Giri is mentioned because that pastime uh, we hear it as Gaudiya Vaishnavas but we actually miss we actually um, Prabhu will know very well because in India we know that um, as Gaudiya Vaishnava, we don't emphasize so much that Leela, right? But in terms of Hinduism or Vedic culture in general, that's one of the most important Leela. And for instance, if you go to, has anyone heard of Angkor Wat in uh, Cambodia? So obviously India now is just a political entity which the British created, modern India. But India was much wider at that time. So even Pakistan, all the Nepal, even up to Tibet, even up to Indonesia, that was all Vedic culture. They were all following. Just like Bali, they have their own version of Hinduism. <laughs> it's a little bit different, but it's based on the Veda. So Cambodia also was Vedic and they had a Vedic king. <clears throat> and he, they, he built hundreds and hundreds of very, very opulent temples. This is not thousands of years ago. It's like maybe, I don't know exactly. A few seven, eight hundred years ago, let's see. Yeah. Nobody's heard of it? We sh yeah, you should check it online, it's very important. So let's see when it's from. Okay, it's just only ninth century, so it's not so long ago. It's not like Jagannath Puri temple or some Sri Rangam. So, but that temple is one of the big, I think it is the biggest temple in the whole world in terms of temple compound. <laughs> It's very much in ruins now because it's so old and they don't have the money to you know, re revive it. But that temple is such a huge temple and there are many, many other temples. Actually, some British explorers, they found many of them just in the jungle with trees and everything like, you know, wooden things fall and everything. So, at this Angkor Wat, there is a huge depiction. There's a whole Bhagavatam different parts, but one is this churning of the milk ocean. And this is very important in the other parts of the Vedas, this Leela. So this Leela is very important and it's mentioned that in this Leela then the Lord, uh, what did it say, where is it? Uh, yeah, the yogi should concentrate on the polished ornaments which are burnished by Mount Mandra as it revolved. <clears throat> because on the back of the Lord they were using it as the pivoting to churn the milk ocean. Both the demons and the demigods, they were churning the milk ocean to get the nectar out. So that's very nice that he's mentioned there, <clears throat> that example. So I think we covered everything. There is like a five, six minutes, if anyone has any question, comment, correction, reflection. Do you have any thoughts? Anything, Prabhu? <laughs> if not, I want to share something, but any question? That uh, I heard from Kesha Maharaj, there's a very nice Leela linked to this churning pastime. It's not directly related to this text, but 
and he, dis he explains uh, this story of Prahlad Maharaj, right? So Prahlad Maharaj had to go through <coughs> many trials and tribulations, right? Can anyone remind us what is one of the trials, Prabhu? You remember? What was it? It was burning oil, eh? I think so, oil or something. So oil and then there's many times he went through. Trampled by elephants and then he was thrown off a cliff. Poisoned. Huh? In the fire. So, so many things, right? But throughout all of that, he was never harmed at all. Because he was always protected. Actually, it's linked to the verse. Because in the Sanskrit, it's mentioning Sarva something uh, Palana, right? What was it? I see, Kali Yuga brain. Already forgot. <laughs> it's mentioned here. Adiloka Palana. So, that's also Nashingadev. He's Adiloka Palana. He came from another place just to help Prahlad Maharaj. <clears throat> so he mentions, related to this churning of the milk ocean pastime, it's a very funny, I don't know where he got it from, maybe some Acharya, I don't know. But he mentions that the Prahlad Maharaj, they asked him, that how did you survive, you know? It seems very difficult, the situation you are put through. Just like, um, uh, they put him in a pit of snakes, they threw him in the pit of very poisonous venomous snakes. But he was not harmed. So they said, how was it you were thrown in the pit of snakes, but you were not harmed? Then Prahlad Maharaj said, the reason I was not harmed is that they are snakes. And my father, he's the, the Ananta Shesha is there. So how the snakes will hurt me? <laughs> that the leader of the snakes is devotee. So why, why will I get hurt? The snakes are all servant of him. And then uh, they mentioned another one that they said, what about the, the poison? That you were given the poison, right? So he said, no, because when the demons didn't go, they were churning the milk ocean. Many, many things came out before they got the nectar. One of the things was poison came out, right? And then what came out after the poison? Someone remember? Lakshmi. So he said that if poison came out, then Lakshmi came out. That means poison, that's my maternal uncle. So why is my maternal uncle going to hurt me? He's my family member. So I was administered poison, but the poison fell bad. This is my family member, my nephew. My sweet young boy, infant nephew, why will I kill him? <laughs> so it's a very interesting little. So Keshav Maharaj explained one by one this pastime. All of the, how, all of the ways Palad Maharaj was attacked by Ranigashibu, how he was protected. So this is the nature of the Lord. And to end, I will just, there was a nice point I wanted to end with. <clears throat> Just as there's the four arms of the Lord, which are the source of the powers, right? So the Shanka, Chakra, Gada, Padma, how we say in English? The Konch, the Sudarshan Chakra, the Lotus and, what's the last one? The Club. <coughs> and the Disc. So, just in those ways, the demigods, they become empowered. So in Bhakti Yoga, we also require to become empowered, right? To do anything for Krishna, especially in Kali Yuga, is not easy to do any service. Because there is so much difficulty, right? Kalodoshani Dairajan. But we know that just like they have very uh, complex, rigorous thing they have to follow. Satya, Masteyam, all of these rules and regulations. Brahmacharya, so many things. And they have to do very strict pranayam. They have to do very strict preparation to do uh, sitting asana. So many things they have to do, these yogis. But we all you have to do is chant the holy name, hear and chant. Many things, but the essence is healing and chanting, right? <clears throat> so that's explained. Just as the, the demigods, they are empowered by the Lord. They are given the Shakti by the Lord. They, be, they become empowered. So in the same way, Sri Chaitanya Mahapuru, Chaitanya Chaitanya explains that what is the method for empowerment in Kali Yuga. That Kali Kalera Dharma, what is the Dharma for Kali Yuga? You know, because you are always in ecstasy on that. Yes. To perform Harinam Sankirtan Yagya, right? Like Prabhu is always in ecstasy on Harinam. <laughs> so when we do Harinam Sankirtan Yagya, then we have to remember that this is the Yuga Dharma, this is the specific process given in this age. And Krishna Shakti Vinanehe Tara Pravatan. In order to preach this message, we have to become empowered by the Lord. We have to attract the mercy of the Lord by our sincere heart, dedication, sincerity and dedication to this preaching mission. In that way we can become empowered. Generally we think it's 
very difficult, right? We ask Prabhu, how do I get taste for holy name? It's not easy. But you have to beg for taste. And the way to beg is by chanting. That, O oh Krishna, O energy of Krishna, please engage me in your devotional service. So just as the demigods, they are directly empowered by these four arms of the Lord, we can become empowered by the mridanga and by the chanting of Lord Chaitanya. We can become instruments. So we can take this Sankirtan mission very seriously. This is the most powerful way that we can do this meditation which Kapila is describing. And we can automatically, by the holy name, what becomes revealed? The Nama then? Yeah, and what else? Eh? Uh, four. Nam, Rup, Gun, Lila, right? So automatically all of these things will come. So we have to try our best, do all of our services with dedication and always remember to chant the holy name with enthusiasm and with focus, attention and with devotion. So thank you very much. Just hit nine o'clock exactly. Hare Krishna. Is that a question or what? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Something more about... Um you mentioned this interesting point. Okay, do you think that the, the Krishna is in his name? Yeah. Yeah, of course Krishna is in his name. But then that's actually an offense to the Holy Name. So how do we get over that mentality? And what's the cause of that mentality? Because if we really just realize Krishna is, is his name, and we sit down to chant, surely this whole thing will just reveal itself. Krishna's whole paraphernalia, everything should be there. Either it's there or it's not, you know? It's like, it seems like a duality. So how, how do we cross over that um, inconceivable ocean? So that by hearing regularly, that's why. What is the verse? Hearing regularly, um, Srimatam. No, not that one. Another one. Yeah, yeah, Nityam. That one. Yeah, Nashta Prayasha Badreshu. So thank you, Prabhu. So automatically, Nashta Prayasha. But everything which is inauspicious in the heart becomes destroyed uh, practically to nil, and loving devotional service becomes established as an irrevocable fact. So by, by what is that process? That Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. So we have to be constantly hearing. So whenever we have time, just like uh, sometimes we think, oh, I listened to Bhagavatam class today, that's enough. That's not enough. We have to also read. And not only reading, we have to listen lecture also like Prabhupada or our Guru Maharaj or other devotee. So we have to do all of them. Just like now I was coming on the train this morning. So most people are wasting their time listening to Led Zeppelin, Katy Perry, uh, I don't know, so many of these mu musicians, right? So the whole one hour is wasted of the human form of life. But if you put a lecture on, then not only you study one hour Bhagavatam, you study two hours. And then if you're coming back from Harinam, another one hour. Like that. If you're going for a walk, I don't know, you're going to buy something, then put a lecture on. So by listening, because reading is very important, a lot of, if you listen to by lecture, most of what is in the book is not always in the lecture, because lecture was mainly for new people, especially CC and more deeper topics, but it's there in the books. So books is very important, because you will not find what is in the books anywhere else. But at the same time, I mean, you can read on the train, but for instance, if you're taking bath, brushing your teeth, you're cooking Rajbog, then you can put lecture. So the solution is by constantly hearing, then our faith becomes very strong in the absolute nature of the Lord. And then also a practical question. Uh, in using all of that time, is it more valuable to use the time for extra chanting or for extra hearing if they're not different? Uh, you can see for you personally. You can do both. <laughs> but I think personally, at least for me, I think because unless you've finished all of Prabhupada's books minimum one time. Generally we have to do like every five, ten years again and again. Bhagavatam, maybe if you read 25 pages every day, it will take you two years. So every five years we can reread, especially Gita, Bhagavatam, Sisi, five, ten years we should be, not only once. So reading is important, because, but it depends. When you have more taste, then you will automatically chant more. But if you don't have taste, sometime by reading, then you learn more about the glories of the Lord. It gives you more taste to chant, gives you more inspiration. So it can be a mix of both. But personally, I like to li listen more. Because there's so much nectar to learn and to hear. So, but it depends, you know. You can, do, you can do a bit of both. Okay, Jai. So time is finished. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Matajis. So now we will take Prashad. Hare Krishna. Radha Govinda Deva Ki Jai Radha Govinda Deva Ki Jai